you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. My Zivvy's book club pick, but your amazing, amazing, amazing novel, Summer Romance. So good. Loved it so much. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for reading it and thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. It's so good. It's just so good. Okay. Tell everybody what it's about, first of all. So it's about a professional organizer whose life is a total mess. Her house is a mess. Um, she's grieving the loss of her mother. Her husband has recently left about a year ago and she is completely stuck and she gets it in her head that maybe having a summer romance with this guy who's just going to be in town for the summer might be just the thing to get her unstuck. That's the premise. Okay. I think that's a good one. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's a good summary. It's a long elevator ride if that's the pitch. <laughs> um, where did this come from? Uh, it really came from like the deepest place in my heart. Um, I thought I was going to write a book. I wanted to write a book about a professional organizer whose house was a mess. Um, is I, your is your house a mess? My house is a total disaster. Yeah. And I mean, I'm working on it. Okay. But like, I just don't, I'm not a person with like baskets in my pantry. No. Have you ever had uh, an, an organizer come to your house? Yeah, one time. I think she died on the way out. I think she was <laughs> like, I don't know how to help you. Um, but I think it's so interesting sometimes how our external lives uh, look a certain way and our internal lives look so different. And we're just trying. Yep. Um, and we have so much stuff. Yeah. Like I wanted, I kind of wanted to write a book about all the stuff, mm -hmm. our emotional stuff, yep. our clutter, all of those things. And then I was going to have her get a divorce and fall in love with her divorce attorney. Because mm. I thought that was kind of interesting. Like it was, it's an interesting way for someone, they find out a lot about you. Like I'm, I'm imagining in my head, my divorce attorney's reaction, should he open up a book? Yes. By you. Be like, oh, I could have ended up in with love with your I could have had Zinni. <laughs> but then I got so bored by the idea of a divorce attorney. I just thought that. So anyways, it evolved into the guy she actually falls in love with is pretending to be her divorce attorney. Yeah. And he is a very, very loose skateboarding guy. Yeah. What was with the costumes? The divorce attorney costumes in the, in the legal settings. He was loose. Yeah. He came from a loose so family. Funny. He um, and he was so angry at her husband and mm -hmm. sort of the control that he had over her that he wanted her husband to keep thinking that he really was incompetent <laughs> when he was actually rather smart. Yes. But one way for people to think you're clueless is just always wear a costume, mm -hmm. you know, dress crazy and they won't take you seriously. Um, so I had a lot of fun with him. He's great. And He's why dreaming. why the skateboard storyline? I like that. Have you ever been on a skateboard? No. If I was on a skateboard, you haven't I, even tried. No, I'd be dead. I'd be dead. I'm not a coordinated person. I've never been on a skateboard. I'm not balanced. Annabelle, I see an Instagram reel in your future on this. You do? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm just gonna check my health insurance. Yeah. Put a helmet uh, and at yeah, least one helmet. Full body armor. Yes. Of some. Um, I don't know where. Oh, you know where that actually I do know where um, the whole skateboard idea is. I, for some reason, was thinking of him as Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, mm. but super attractive. Mm. Um, I was thinking of him as that kind of like playing that kind of a role. And so I thought for some reason that guy had a skateboard and I dug into skateboarding and it's actually very Zen. Uh, there's a lot of like spiritual thought behind skateboarding and letting go and balancing and letting go of your fear um, and doing something that absolutely looks like it's impossible, like it defies gravity. Um, I don't know. I, I got into it. It was fun. I feel like, are there any skateboard championships or something? Have you watched that? There, there must should be. be right? right? Sean White. Something. something. I don't know. Maybe he skis. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So these are just like some of the decisions you make on characters and setting and plot and blah, blah, blah. As I go. As you go. Yes. But the heart of the book is not about these things. These are just like the drapes on the house, right? Yes. The heart is the loss and the love and the finding your voice and finding your place and having the relationship that you deserve and all of that stuff. Yeah. Where, tell me more about that. It's a lifetime. That's <laughs> like a, it's like 54 years of thought about things um, sort of went into this book. There's a lot about being a woman. Um, and the, at, at first, you know, the decisions that we make, uh, the things we let go of for other people, mm -hmm. to care for other people, um, the dreams we sort of release, 
there's a lot of that in this, this book. Um, there's a lot of motherhood and the complexity of motherhood, which I, for me, I find that the hardest thing about being a mother is letting my children fail, mm. letting them struggle, letting them do something that I know is going to be a disaster so that they can feel the disaster and learn and move on. Um, I talk a big game about that. I have a really hard time doing it. Me too. Um, I mean, I, I, I will call and remind my children about things a hundred times when the right thing is like, they don't file a tax return today. I know. I see. <laughs> I mean, like you just like it, it's just gonna happen. Um, that's very difficult. And I think that as we grow as people, and certainly after we lose our parents, we have a different perspective on our parents where we thought maybe they were just nagging us all the time, but then we come to understand that that was the love they were showing us. And how how lucky were we to have people who were stepping in in our lives like that. So it's there's two sides of it. It's too much, but also it's so beautiful the way we mother. True. You had a line in there that I was like, yes, exactly. When you said something like um, uh, the phone was ringing and you're like, well, I have to, I always have to pick up. I'm a mom. Like I have to pick up. Like, of course. Yeah. No, <laughs> there's no like, oh, I'll just turn my phone off for 24 hours. And then you have one scene in the car, not giving anything away, but she's on her way somewhere she wants to go and is almost there. And then something kid related happens and she literally has to turn around, which is such a perfect sort of metaphor, right? Yeah. For like, as we get closer, sometimes then we just go right back where we started. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to try and try. Exactly. Because you're never going to not be there for your kids. Yeah. Um, and my mom was super hands off. Um, she was very much a 1970s, like, hope this works out. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was the baby. So it was like, she was kind of done by the time I was growing up. And that, that in and of itself was such a gift. Like the fact that I, um, I kind of tread water a lot on my own. I learned so much. Um, and I kind of worked that into the book as sort of a contrast to Allie's mother, who is like always stepping in in her marriage and mm -hmm. always trying to make things seem like they're actually better so that Allie doesn't really feel the reality of her situation. Yeah. And then I, I was surprised she gets to a point of almost like this little sliver of resentment, like, why did my mom make it okay? Yeah. Like, why was that even the right thing? Was my mom doing the right thing? And, and I would argue she wasn't, mm. you know, I, um, I think that once people are adults, this is a big thing to say, I think we kind of have to leave them alone. Mm. You make your decisions. I'm going to make my decisions. If you ask me for my opinion, I'm going to give it to you, but we just have to let people's lives play out. Um, there's a certain amount of control that goes with loving somebody. You know, you just want to keep them safe. Yep. And I, I, I don't know how healthy that is. I mean, in thinking about it, if you're a type, if you're the type of parent who thinks you have to make the best of this relationship, right? You're, you're assuming that divorce is not really an option, right? You go, you come at relationship problems with a different point of view yep. than if you think it's on the table. Yeah, that's true. Right. And I feel like her mom was more of the like, well, this is. This is what this is your lot in life, and here's how we're going to make it better. No, you made a decision, yeah. and we're going to we're, we're going to make it the right decision. Yeah. Um, but I think sometimes you need to let people to like step back and let people actually feel the situation that they're in, um, and find their voice. Yeah. I mean, if, if I write another book about a woman finding her voice, it's like I'm beating a dead horse. You're not. But I am. It's like it's this this idea that we really we say so many things that are not the things we mean. And we don't say so many things that we need to say. Um, I think there are so. never enough. And I say this because I feel like this is what I try to write about. <laughs> there are never well, enough sure. books about trying to find your voice because so many people don't yeah. know who they are. They feel like they can't speak up and then they're not happy and life just passes them by. Yeah. And like, that's sad. And all you have is your voice. Yeah. You know, all you have, I mean, I'm thinking about blank also. It's yeah. like, all you have is, is this ability to tell your story. Mm -hmm. um, and if nobody's going to hear it, I, it's just, yeah, it's the so, point of what we're doing. I agree. I agree. And we are literally writing. Yes. You are writing it in. Yes. <laughs> um, go back to your mom for two seconds. Yeah. So you said she's just okay to sort of let you hang out there, but you're obviously, you have so much love for her as oh. evidenced by this book. It's just, you could feel it. Like you could, I could read it and be like, okay, she misses her mom. Like what is going on? This is like, this is the front 
Yeah. And this, where is the real story? So t just tell me about her as a person and your relationship together. Oh my gosh. This is Barbara Walters. Hello. Um, no, I, my, so my mom's been gone for 15 years. Um, my mom was this just unbelievably vibrant, beautiful, funny, smart person. Uh, she had tons of fun. She was like the most fun person in the world. Um, and she, uh, she had a bit of a faith in me as the much younger, youngest of her children. Um, and how many kids? Were, we were three. We're all five years apart. Okay. Although my sister says we're four years apart. We're five years apart. Okay. Um, I, can, I think you can look that up somewhere. I, I, I bet I you, like, I bet you can figure I that one out. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, I was the baby. She was doing other things. She had a faith in me. Um, she was not hands-on in a practical way, but she was very hands-on emotionally. Mm -hmm. Like she always knew what was going on. She always, you know, was tuned in and available. Um, she was an amazing person. And as you'll see in the book, Allie talks to her mom in the car. Um, I talk to my mom in the car all the time, out loud. Um, and there's there's an author's note in the back of this book um, just to explain to the reader that I'm not completely insane. I, I'm not hearing voices of my mother. But I do think that if somebody's loved you for a really long time, um, you sort of internalize that love and you know what they would have said. Mm -hmm. You know, you think, I mean, when we're a hundred years old, we're going to know like, oh, you know what my mom would have said in this situation because they've said it enough times. Um, and that is still sort of alive. And so I feel my mom around me all the time. Well, that's such a gift. I oh, mean, it's just wonderful. Like, with our kids, you know, when we're not here, if yeah. when, you know, that they would know what we would say and it could comfort them even if we're not there. Yes. Like, wouldn't we want that? Yes. Like, I'm sure that would make your mom happy. Oh, I, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, yes. I think the whole thing would make her happy. I think everything that's going on right now, including me sitting here with you, would Talking make her better. Oh, yes. she would just be so happy. Um, and, you know, the flip side of that, not to turn it dark, but there are things that your parents say all the time that they probably shouldn't have said mm -hmm. that you will hear in your head forever. Mm -hmm. um, so, which just also adds to the responsibility of being a parent. Yes. Don't say the wrong thing. Yes. Everything your parents say, there should be like an asterisk to say, but I am from a different generation. For sure. You know, like for sure. That is, this is the best advice. You know, I remember my, my parents give me advice I shouldn't even talk, but you know, like, actually, I'm not even going to say it, but it was just like very antiquated. Yeah, of course. Things you wouldn't say to a friend today. No, of course. But that's what, that's what they knew. That's yeah. how they grew up. So, yeah. And then there's some advice that's timeless. That's true. Yeah. So, oh, and how, yeah, you don't have to say, but how did your mom pass away? Breast cancer. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, well, the love of the mother's love, it's like a 360 mother's love in the book. But then there's so much like sexy fun as well, right? It's like the two things. The best of all worlds. The best of all worlds. Um, I'm also wondering, I haven't met your husband, but how is he feeling about all of this romance and um, longing and lust and everything going on in your books? Is he like into it? That's a great question. Uh, my husband is probably the most private person you'll meet. Okay. Um, so my doing what I'm doing right now is literally his worst nightmare. So if I get up in front of a crowd of people to speak, he's sweating in the back. Like, oh, oh no. God, please don't let her have to do this. Like, it's horrible. Um, on the other hand, I think he thinks this is really fun. And he knows that this is the dream that I've had my whole life. Um, this book and Nora goes off script. He read them both and he said, Oh, I'm feeling really emotional. Like mm. they, there, there are a lot of inside jokes about our marriage in this book. Um, so I think he thinks it's fun. I think he connects to it. What's an inside joke about your marriage that we didn't know was an inside uh, joke? The pantry. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I honestly have like six boxes of cornstarch in my pantry. I just keep buying it because I need a tablespoon every year. I, I just, I, I'm not organized about a lot of things. Um, he's also messy, so it doesn't bother him. But yes, no, there's there's tons of them. <laughs> also, maybe cornstarch goes bad. Maybe, maybe you're being too hard on first yourself. First of all, maybe it's not good for us at all. Maybe we should just get rid of it. Yeah. Get rid of it all. Yeah, and then but then it wouldn't be funny in the book. No, I know. I know. The pantry. So when you're writing, because it makes me laugh when I'm reading your books. Like, it is always like, I know I will get, I like, I feel like you have a recipe going. And I reliably know I am going to feel moved. I'm going to chuckle. 
there's going to be some sort of relationship thing that's very exciting and there's like a bigger meaning to it too and that I will leave your books feeling oh so satisfied in every single way so tell me about the laughter factor and the jokes because you have this kind of dry sense of humor but it's so funny and all your characters have it because it's you, you know that's your funny voice and even your instagram comments like they're funny you you you're, it's you. and it's just such a you thing like nobody else jokes in the same way it's so distinctive so tell me about that wow um well it's a really nice compliment thank you i mean uh, i and really I, really mean it i really wish there was a recipe um I think I think that when humor lands in my books or something that I write, it's because I haven't thought it through. Hmm. If I stop to think about if if I'm typing really fast, the humor is better. Huh. If I try to be smart, everything kind of falls apart. Interesting. Um, so maybe some of that just I don't know. Maybe it comes from my my subconscious or or something. Um, I really wish there was a recipe though. Uh, I'm writing a book right now and I'm trying to get the recipe right and I'm um, I find that sometimes I'm laughing and then I'll start writing a chapter and I'll get really bored okay which I know for sure means that the chapter I'm writing is really boring <laughs> so then I have to go back and delete that entire chapter oh, no. and start writing something that I start getting that good feeling again okay tell me about the next one uh, oh, so she's a child star <laughs> Okay. Um, and she's trying to make it in Hollywood as an adult. Huh. Yeah. Huh. I like that. Huh. I like a lot of things about it. A couple things I don't like, but I don't have to be finished till August. So it, we'll get there. That's not so far. No, it's not so far. <laughs> and I have a few things to do between now and then. Like too. launch this entire book. Like launch this book. Yes. Yeah. So when are you going to do that? Are you stressed? Fourth? No. Not stressed. You know, it'll get done. Uh, it'll get done. It'll get done. It's actually something I really like writing. Mm -hmm. um, so, convenient, convenient. Which is great. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's such a blessing because if there's something you have to do a ton of, um, it's nice if you like it. Um, so I will, you know, and the, the, it'll it'll start taking on a life of its own. It's just started to take on a life of its own and then it gets fun mm -hmm. and it'll get done. Okay. This is my mantra. <laughs> I know, I just, I'm trying to write another book and at the top I had to put something like, this is all blank, but it will be filled with words. It will be a novel and I can do this because every time I open it, I'm like, I don't think I can do this. Yeah. You know, like somehow where are the words going to come from? But they're all going to land there. They're yeah. going to like, re get that good like, fish in a net, like in the brain. <laughs> just they're like going to come. Swirling up. You know. Where are they? Yeah. I really, what did Carly Fortune, what was the word she put on her computer? It was like joy or fun or something for her last book. And every time she sat down to write, she just focused on that word. Huh. Like, this isn't going to be work. This is going to be fun today. Great. Um, and then she wrote a really great book. Huh. Again. So. I hate her. No, <laughs> she's the worst. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, you've said in the past you have, like, a whole routine of what you do for your writing day. Are you still upholding the routine? And can you share it again? Uh I, it, here's my ideal routine. Okay. It's like when people talk about their exercise routine, yeah. you know, yeah. my ideal routine is I get up really early mm -hmm. um, and I get up uh, before my brain kicks in and starts thinking about sprinklers or whatever my brain thinks about. Um, and I write until my household wakes up and then I engage with my household. I walk my dog, I walk my body, and then I sit back down to write. Mm. Um, I find that if I can have a huge chunk of time to write, I'm a lot better off. Mm -hmm. um, this weekend, my family was gone and I wrote for three days straight. Wow. Um, and I cracked the code. I was like, oh, I think I understand what this story is. Uh, I have a really hard time getting there in an hour mm -hmm. or in 90 minutes. And I have friends who write in coffee shops or, you know, in the car between things. I just, I can't, I can't focus the way I like to focus in that short amount of time. But I wonder how good it is in the coffee shop. Do you think they keep those words? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if I, I can't do that either. That's there's why, nothing that's more why I'm personal joking about than it. writing. I really think if people do it in such no, a I'm totally kidding. different way. Um, and you know, I have I have friends who write a chapter and then they perfect the chapter mm -hmm. before they get to the next chapter. I write garbage to get to the next chapter just to get words. I write all the garbage 
And then I go back and I'm like, ooh, let's clean up the garbage. It's just a different process. When did you know that you were finally going to achieve this lifelong dream of doing what you're doing right now? Like, when did you, when were you like, okay, like actually this is happening and I might be able to keep doing this and this is really cool. I think when I sold Nora Goes Off Script and it was enthusiastic, like it was a, we want this book. Um, and then I talked to my editor for the first time and she was just a genius. And I thought, is this the person I've been waiting for my entire life? You know, it's like you meet the man at the bar. I was like, she's the one. <laughs> um, and I just couldn't believe it. Because I, I wrote that book during COVID. I've told mm -hmm. you this a hundred times. I never thought that was going to get published. I thought, you know, I'd probably be dead by the end of the summer. I might as well write this book. And so I, I, I just didn't have this, like, that wasn't part of my career plan. Mm -hmm. I was just writing a book because I like to write. Well, that's it. Isn't that the secret? Like, if you don't like doing it, yeah, I don't know. Don't tell my kids. <laughs> you know, they're all like in calculus. You, you can't tell kids, like, just follow your bliss because there's so many things you have to do that you're not going to enjoy. But hopefully you're going to end up coming back to the thing that you loved, whatever that is. And your kids are still in the house? I thought they were older. No, they are. So two live in the city. Okay. Um, they're out of college. And then one is a senior in high school. So I almost have everybody out of the house, which is another thing to do this summer. <laughs> but then you can go back to the organizer. Yes. Yes. I think you are going to have organizers like throwing themselves on you, volunteering to clean out your pantry. Okay. Okay. Well, mark just, my word. I, I will pray for all of those people and for their sanity. <laughs> uh, I mean, one last thing with all of the stuff and it's on more of like a, you know, a, a bittersweet note is this notion that all of our stuff is going to have to be cleaned out, right? Whether it's the couple that's moving down to Florida for a while and you have to dismantle their whole house and sell it and like piece by piece, or if it's just the belongings of somebody you love or the um, Phyllis next door and all of her stuff and the books, like that is the condition of all of us that we choose to not think about every single day. But if you've ever packed anyone up after they've gone, you know, that the stuff becomes a big thing and it will happen. And I, I think about that whenever I, something comes in, I'm like, this is just one more thing. Like, what are people going to do with this? Yeah. You know, no, so that's right. How do we live accumulating stuff and keeping that all the meaningful stuff with the time we have to like go through the memory boxes yeah. and all of that. So I don't know. I feel like I there's a little of all of that. And I think, throughout. I think that you also hit on, really basic the basic question of this book is you buy something and eventually it's going to go into a landfill mm -hmm. right you get a dog and that dog's going to die someday you have a summer romance mm -hmm. it's going to be labor day you're going to have to say goodbye so our life is so much about um the gathering of things and the letting go of things um and you know maybe the secret is the joy that we hang on to in you know in the interim. Um, but it, yeah, it's a lot of stuff that we accumulate. Yeah. Well, it's better to have loved and lost, we yes. say, as I'm staring at my dog. So, yes, <laughs> no, God, the dog thing. I mean, I really like it's the dogs, it, but the dogs played a big role. And the whole thing yeah. of are you willing to give your love for something that you know won't last forever? That's right. And we have to. That's we right. We just have to. I have a friend who adopts dying dogs. Oh. She falls in love with them and she ushers them, you know, for the last couple of years of their lives. Um, and it's joy. It's really beautiful. It is really beautiful. Um, any last advice for authors who are trying to do what you do? Aspiring uh, authors? Yes. You know, I've been thinking so much about this. Um, and I've probably been saying this forever, but I'm really thinking about it now. Don't write the book that everybody wants to read. Don't try to write the next Taylor Jenkins read. Don't, don't write that book write the book that you're supposed to write, mm -hmm. write the book that, uh, that you're dying to read or that feels that gets you up early in the morning to start writing. Um, because that's the book that's going to connect to you and it's going to ring true to people. Yeah. Um, we can't just have one voice out there. We can't all be mimicking each other's voices. So you got to write your own story. This is going back to what we were just saying. Yes. Stories about women finding their voices. That's right. Full circle. That's well, right. Boy, I'm a one trick pony. <laughs> <laughs> God, Jimmy. 
Um, well, congratulations. I am just, this book is so good. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank I don't you. even know what to recommend more. I love Nora so much. Thank and you. obviously your other book too. But anyway, Thank you. all right, congratulations. Thank you, Zippy. Welcome, Annabelle.